Well, today we continue in our study of what has been called the spiritual Alps, the New Testament, spiritual Rocky, Rocky Mountains. And it's called that because of its towering, almost breathtaking spiritual truths that Paul uh, addresses there, there in this particular epistle. Certainly, you know, we've talked about how that Paul was in prison at that time. Certainly, God was moving upon him in a very special way. And uh, so much, what a great loss we would have if, if Paul had not gone to prison, uh, first Roman imprisonment, and, and uh, had written these epistles. And we know that as we went through chapter 1, certainly the Spirit of God taught us some great, great truths, and then we'll continue to learn uh, some of what we covered as we continue through this epistle. But certainly one of the great truths that we is foundational in the epistle to the Ephesians is the, the great uh, reality that because we're one in Christ, because we're in union with Him, we know it talks about how that Christ talked about how that we would be in Him and he and us, and he and the Father, so therefore we have this close relationship. And because of, of this special relationship we have, every spiritual blessing in heaven is ours as well as Christ. And certainly it tells us, going back to this epistle, I'll just hit a couple of the highlights as we continue, that, that we not lose the foundation of this epistle, but it tells us in Ephesians, the first chapter in one, in verse three, blessed or praised be God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all, as we've talked about the original Greek, is every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, and actually places is in italics, which is not in the original text, but in the heavenlies, basically, is what it means. I mean, it almost has a mystical uh, aura to it as you read those particular words. But spiritually speaking, we are seated with Christ in the heavens, and therefore every spiritual blessing is ours. Uh, to appropriate, if we appropriate it in faith and obedience. Of course, both of those dynamics are important, and they both, they both go together. And, and Paul wants to wake us up to our inheritance that we have in Christ, and that, that's part of the great, uh, one of the great purposes that Paul has in this epistle is, is to awaken us to these truths. This, it would be easy for us to overlook and take for granted because we live in a world that has a, a tendency to drag us back down to its its level, and we're surrounded by a lot of distractions. But Paul wants us to not lose sight of the fact that our citizenship, he talks about that in, in, in the book of Philippians, that our citizenship is in heaven. And we know that if it is, and we are God's people, our name is already written in the book of life, and hopefully if we remain faithful, it will continue to be written there. But Paul wants us to be aware and to not lose sight of the fact. And as I mentioned, as you travel through this epistle, you, you hear the, the emphasis upon riches and upon inheritance and upon the great wealth that we have in Christ. And so Paul wants us to not lose sight of that. But in verse 11, Ephesians 1 and verse 11, he, he, he tells us in whom also we have obtained an inheritance being predestinated according to the purpose of him who works all things after the counsel of his, of his own will. And so the Bible talks about the will of Christ, just like you would consider, compare it to the will that we may have physically and with an inheritance. And we have this great inheritance in Jesus Christ. And of course, it tells us later on in Ephesians 5, 17, be not unwise, but why? Concerning the will of the Lord. And as I've mentioned so many times, you know, if you want to know what's in the will, then you have to read the will. And of course, the will of God is in the Bible. And that's why it's so important that we stay uh, glued to this book, that we spend much time reading and studying it, because that's 
what's going to really keep us knowledgeable and inspired and certainly uh, having the understanding of what the will of God really is. It's something we grow into all the time. And uh, you know, what a, what, a, what a wonderful epistle this is. Well, last week uh, we ended by talking about the great power that's available to us through Christ. Uh, and it tells us, again, let's just go back and get a little speed gathered up as we go on into chapter 2. But it tells us Paul ends this chapter, Ephesians 2, or excuse me, Ephesians 1 and verse 16. Ephesians 1 and verse 16, where he says, I cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. Of course, understand that, that Paul's prayer has included us as well, and uh, for all of us. It's amazing that uh, his prayers are still being answered today. That the eyes of your understanding are actually, actually the, the, the eyes of your heart is a, is a way it might be translated. Being enlightened are actually flooded with light. It's light that Christ comes in with this epistle. He just floods our minds with this great light that he was have us to have by our inheritance in Christ that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. And of course, as I mentioned, you need to always bear in mind, this is a paramount scripture about what calling is, that calling is enlightenment. And uh, that's the truth I learned years ago in one of those little uh, booklets that, I, that uh, Herbert Ostro wrote years ago still have some of them, that calling is enlightenment, but this, this is the key scripture that was given. And, and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us or to believe, according to the working of his mighty power. Of course, that word power, as we've talked about in the Greek, is dynamis. We actually get our Greek word uh, dynamite from that particular word. We get the word dynamic from that particular word, which is a power. Which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places. And where there again, places you will notice if you have a King James Bible is in the italics and actually it can be translated in the heavens or in the heavenlies. <clears throat> Far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name it is named not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. And has put all things under his feet, and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that fills all in all. So we realize and understand that we are part of the body of Christ if we have his spirit. And it's well to remember that as we continue in chapter 2, and that chapter divisions in the Bible are artificial. And really, uh, this, this chapter stops, and oftentimes it often happens that the chapters stop and start in the wrong places because Paul is really continuing his thought. Now, remember chapter divisions in the Bible uh, actually are, as I've said, artificial. They actually, the division of the Bible into, into chapters was attributed to the Archbishop of Canterbury, Stephen Langton, about the year 1227. He's the one who first divided the Bible into chapters. Uh, the Wycliffe Bible, actually, a John Wycliffe's Bible in 1382 was the first Bible that actually would use these chapter divisions. The Hebrew Old Testament was divided into verses by a Jewish rabbi by the name of Nathan about 1448 A.D. I mean, oftentimes we read the Bible, we think, you know, this is always this way, but no, it wasn't. Uh, we know that the New Testament uh, was actually uh, uh, divided into verses by a man, man by the name of Robert Einstein, also named as Stephanus, and his edition of the Greek New Testament about 1551, uh, his son said actually that, that his dad actually divided that Greek New Testament into verses in a trip he made from from uh, Paris or actually from Lyon from Paris to Lyons, France, on horseback. And on that trip, 
he had the time to to devote uh, when he stopped to the dividing of the New Testament into verses. Uh, the uh, actually the 1557 translation of the Latin Vulgate was the first Bible that actually used uh, that the, you know used the the Bible divided it into chapter and verses. The first English Bible to use uh, chapters and verses was actually the Geneva Bible back in 1560. And of course, you know, it's kind of interesting because the Geneva Bible, of course, came before the uh, King James Bible. The Puritans actually that, that settled in America actually preferred the Geneva Bible actually over the King James, but that was actually the first Bible to be divided into chapters and verses. But the, the, the important point I want to make, however, is that Paul really he, 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 chapter 2 begins, continues his thought here of the resurrection of Christ, of how that, that God's mighty power uh, was what the Father was, what resurrected Christ and enabled him to be resurrected and to, to be set at the right hand of God the Father. And that great power that was exerted is the same power that you and I have available to us through God's Spirit. But it's important to understand that now Paul, in, in Ephesians 2 and verse 1, draws a similar uh, comparison to help us to understand this great power that has also resurrected us spiritually. And notice what he says here, and you has he quickened. Now, you will notice here again in the King James, and I think I don't see this in any of the other translations. And I think actually the words are added here by the commentators or by the translators was actually good because it's really continues the thought. You'll find that even down in verse 5, where it talks about us being quickened or made alive in Christ. Uh, so certainly this is the, the beginning thought of this chapter, but Paul continuing his thought from verse 1. And so he, he talks about the resurrection of Christ, the great power that was exerted in, re, in raising Christ from the dead. And it's the same power that's uh, made alive in us. But you has he quickened, or actually the word made, there is made alive, who were dead and trespasses and sins. And, and so Paul wants us to, to awaken to this fact that this great power that, that resurrected Christ from the dead also has brought us, made us alive spiritually through the power of Christ. You know, it's interesting because uh, I've got another Bible I brought here with me today, a, a Moffat translation of the Bible. Actually, uh, James Moffat was actually a, uh, a British commentator. And uh, quite a command of the English language, but but later on uh, in this chapter to to Ephesians, he talks about uh, and talking about the, the armor of God. As he finishes up talking about the armor of God, the way James Moffat translates it, Ephesians six and verse eighteen, prayed at all times in the Spirit with all manner of prayer and entreaty. And I like the way that, that he translates it, this, be alive to that. <laughs> Attend to it unceasingly. Be alive to that. That's the way he translates it. Be alive to this truth. And it is like Paul is saying in this, in, in verse 1 of chapter 2, you know, be alive to this, this great power that, that you also have been uh, resurrected to a new life in Christ. And you has he quickened or made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins. Of course, we know that the wages of sin is death, and they're called the works of darkness. And, and uh, we were spiritually dead. Uh, not just spiritually dead, we, for all practical purposes, we were physically dead if we consider eternity, if it had not been for the sacrifice of Christ. But you know, it, it's interesting, uh, you know, I've been through several operations. And I know that I always know what a serious consideration it is when you go through an operation. 
And uh, uh, after I was converted, uh, some of the operations I've had since, I always commit my spirit into God's hands before you know, I pass, I'm anesthetized and uh, pass some consciousness, as, as it happens when you have an operation, because I know anything can happen. But it's interesting because, you know, those of you who have gone through operations, you start, you start coming out of anesthesia, and, and it occurs to you, <laughs> I'm alive. I'm not dead. I remember years ago I was in an uh, uh, operating room, and I had just come out. Of the operation, it was waking up, and I heard I heard the uh, some of the nurses there, male nurses, tell this man, "Well, we're not angels; you're still alive." And and you know you you realize as you start coming out of this anesthesia, you know I'm alive, and it's like Paul, through the Spirit of Christ, wants to waken us, wake us up to this realization that we're alive in Christ. We've been resurrected to a new life. And I think that's important for us to understand because, you know, the, the adversary is certainly, Satan and the devil would like to anesthetize our, our minds, so to speak, to the truth that you and I are alive in Christ. That we are to uh, walk a new life. We're alive from the dead spiritually. You know, probably a good paraphrase of, of what Paul's opening thought is here. You know, get out of the graveyard. Get the, the grave clothes off. You're, 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 you've been resurrected to a new life. And that's what you and I need to understand. That we cannot and we should not live like we lived in this world that for all practical purposes is blinded by Satan the devil and, is, and uh, those people out there that uh, have not been called and not had the truth are, are especially discerned. They're cut off. They don't understand. They don't know. They're like, they're like corpses, so to speak. You go talking to them truth, about spiritual truth, they don't understand. And they don't have that comprehension, but uh, that's not the case with you and I. You and I have been given this special truth, and we are alive in Christ. And how much we need, to, how much we need to, to be awake to that. How much we need to have this every day when we wake up to realize uh, this resurrection of life that we've been, that we have been resurrected to. And, of course, these are usually always scriptures here in Romans 6 that we uh, have read to us or we study before uh, we we're baptized. And I remember one of the first questions that I was asked uh, before I was baptized, and thankfully I had done my homework and I had re read and reread the, the uh, booklet on baptism, and the minister called me in uh, we sat down, and he says, well, what is baptism? And he kind of put me on the spot. And I said, well, it's a burial. Well, that was the right answer because that's exactly what baptism is. It's a spiritual burial. But it tells us in Romans 6 and verse 1, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? You know, there are individuals in, in the religious world, especially amongst the Protestant world, that believe that, but no. God forbid, how should we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Or actually, the Greek word there is in the aorist tense, who died to sin. How, how should we that died to sin live any longer therein? Know you not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? I mean, here Paul is trying, you know, you stop to consider, he's trying to, to remind these individuals that have been baptized that what had taken place, because it's easy to forget. But he says, but know you not that so many of us as were baptized in Jesus Christ were baptized unto his death. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead, by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. And, and, and that's, exactly, that's exactly what uh, 
what uh, Paul, what God's Spirit is trying to convey to us in the Epistle of Ephesians, that, that you know we we are alive. This is we're living in a new life, and not to lose not to lose sight of that great truth. You know, you'll notice over here in John the eleventh chapter. It's kind of interesting. Sometimes you miss some of this. At the time of the resurrection of Lazarus, I won't take time to read through the whole story of how he had been, you know, been dead for four days, and and uh, uh, they did not believe he was able to to resurrect Lazarus. But it tells us in, in John 11 and verse 43, speaking of Christ, and when he had thus spoken, he cried with a loud voice, saying, "Lazarus, come forth!" I mean, this certainly is. It, you know, you, you talk about the great shout at the the, the archangel at the, at the at the return of Jesus Christ, and uh, this great shout that Christ makes here at the resurrection of Lazarus. When he thus had spoken, he cried with a loud voice, "Lazarus, come forth!" And he, that was Lazarus, of course, that was dead. John eleven verse forty four came forth bound hand in hand with grave clothes. And his face was bound about with a napkin. You know, you can see this situation. Here he comes out and he's all bound up with these grave clothes and this napkin over his face. And, and Jesus saith unto him, he said, loose him and let him go. And, and, and essentially that's what Paul is talking about here. That's the thought he has. Look, you've been resurrected to new life. Get out of the graveyard. Uh, get off the lake, get off the grave, the grave claws, and lay them aside, and walk in newness of life. We can't continue to live like we did in, in this world. Certainly, the best commentary is always scripture, and I could talk a lot about what it is to to walk in newness of life, but certainly I cannot even come close to what Paul is expressing here in another one of the prison epistles in Colossians. Nobody knows, really knows which epistle was written first, Colossians, Ephesians, or Philemon, or Philippians. But certainly you will find many similarities in these epistles, and some of what, some of what Paul will address here in Colossians 3 uh, is uh, in concert of what Paul will later on address in Ephesians. But notice what we're told here. Colossians 3 in verse 1. Colossians 3 in verse 1. If you then be risen with Christ, I mean, it's, it's almost a challenge that Paul's making there in Colossians. I mean, if, if this has really happened, if you're a new creation, Seek those things which are above where Christ sits on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. You know, it's interesting. You go back to the uh, book of Proverbs, Proverbs 30, and Paul talks about, I actually did a sermon on this at one time about uh, Solomon's zoo here, and uh, Interesting. It's an interesting uh, uh, statement that Paul makes, and many of these characteristics that he talks about, many of these creatures, uh, you can relate to how we ought to be as Christians. But he tells us in Proverbs 30, in verse 29, there be three things which go well, yes, four are comely, or actually, New American uh, Standard translates that as stately, because of course, these are very stately beasts. A lion which is strongest among the beasts and turns not away from any, a greyhound, and a he-goat. It mentions a he-goat. Now, a he-goat, of course, is a, is a magnificent creature, and it likes the high places. It dwells in the high places. And we as Christians are to be like that he-goat. We are to dwell in the high places spiritually. We're not to dwell in the, the, the things of this earth. Now, certainly, there's practical things. We, in physical responsibilities, uh, we 
we uh, uh, we have. You know, someone said one time, you don't want to be so heavily minded, you're, you're of no earthly use. It's obviously, you know, Paul talks about maintaining uh, honest trades and skills and taking care of your responsibilities. But it's talking about spiritually that we are to to be like the he goat. We are to, to seek the high places. Seek those things which are above where Christ sits on the right hand of God. And that's where we're at. <laughs> we're in the heavenlies, and therefore this is where our mind needs to be. This is where our first love needs to be. And there shouldn't be anything more exciting and meaningful to us than to do what, exactly what we're doing now, to open up the Word of God and to read and study. But it says, set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. For you are dead, and your life is hid with Christ and God. You know, Christ has, has hid us in that respect uh, no matter you know, if we die and we're hid in the grave, he still reserved us. We're hidden in him for the resurrection. And that is a, that is a wonderful realization that, we're, that we are hidden in Christ, that uh, our, our salvation is secure as long as we stay in him and he in us. That's a tremendous truth there. I mean, that's, that's a whole sermon right there you can preach for your dead and your life is hid with Christ and God. And when Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then also you shall appear with him in glory. You know, and it tells us here, mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth. It's interesting because, turn another Bible here where I made a different note, but the, the uh, word there for, uh, Greek word there for, for uh, Mortifies nerostate, and it means to make a corpse of. That's what Jameson, Fawcett, and Brown, uh, tremendous insights in that commentary. I'm more, I grew more and more impressed that little commentary all the time, but, but it, it makes this statement that it means in the Greek to make a corpse of. Therefore, your members, which are upon the earth. And so we, we need to put these things to death these lower passions that we might have. Fornication. Wow, you know, porneia. Any type of, of sexual relationship outside of marriage. And, uh, you know, that was a world, that, the, the, that was an un, uh, unheard of thought or value in, in the Greek world at that time. I mean, that was a very promiscuous world and much of the religion was built around promiscuity. And you can well imagine the difficulty it had to be for Paul to convince these individuals that no, uh, the lifestyle you've had is not acceptable. You had to put these things to death. Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth. Fornication, uncleanness, that can be actually unclean physically, uh, as well as, as spiritually. You know, Christ said that, you know, it's the things that come out of a man that defile him, and, uh, you know, evil thoughts and all of that, but uh, uncleanness. Inordinate affection, the word there, pathos, lustful passion. I mean, very lustful passion, you know, lower nature that, 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 man man has. We are to put those things to death. Evil con con concupiscence. 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 That, actually, that particular word in the English language, of course, uh, it, it talks about strong desire, but especially strong sexual desire. And covetousness, which is idolatry. And that word Covetousness, pleonexia, comes from a, a compound Greek word, uh, uh, pleon, more, and, 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 and to have. It actually means uh, to, have, to want to have more. It's that, it's that, that mind of always wanting to acquire more and more, uh, to lust, 
the very avaricious, the very avaricious nature. And it's idolatry because you're putting the acquisition of, of whatever you're lusting after. It, it could be an individual. It could be a weakness. It could be money. It could be prestige. It could even apply within a God's church of, of, a, of, a, of, a, of, a, of a perhaps a minister lusting after someone else's position in the church. Many, many things it, it, could, it could pertain to. But Paul says, look, we have to put the, and it's idolatry because you're putting this in front of God. And even idolaters oftentimes, you know, they worship, they worship an idol because they want to get something out of that idol. They think, well, if I worship this idol, I'm going to get something. Instead of serving God, they want something out of this idol. And uh, we're not to be that way. Covetousness, which is idolatry. And of course, you know, we, we live in a society that certainly one of the greatest idols is wealth and goods. And uh, we, we live in a society that, that breeds discontent and, uh, and wanting to acquire what someone else has or actually destroying the, the, the joy that you have in Christ because you don't have physically what someone else has. And, and, and Paul tells us we're to put these things to death. For which things, for which sake, the, the wrath of God comes on the children of disobedience. In whom also you walked some time when you lived in them. But now you are to put off all these anger, wrath, malice, you know, that deep-seated visceral uh, hatred for someone wanting to do them harm, blasphemy, filthy communication, or, or you know, one translation translates as foul language out of your mouth. All these things, you know, we might think are cute, we might think we're being cute, but they're just not acceptable to God. And we, and we have we have a higher standard than these type of these type of uh, sins. Lie not to one another, seeing that you've put off the old man with his deeds. Of course, here again, you know, here's Paul, the Apostle Paul that they say did away with this, said the commandments were done away with, and he's this is the ninth commandment: not bearing false witness, not lying to one another. Seeing that you put off the old man with his deeds. And having put on the new man, or I could say the new woman by extension, which is renewed, or actually in the Greek is being renewed in the knowledge after the image of him that created him. So this renewal process is continually, it should continue to be taking place. You know, just like the body renews itself every seven years, I say every cell in your body after seven years has been renewed. Uh, spiritually, we need to be continuing to be renewed in knowledge after the image of Him that created Him. Where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond nor free, but Christ is all and in all. And there again, we see. Uh, this truth that, that is conveyed in the epistle to Ephesians of how Christ is in us and we are in him. But put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, 